Hi everyone, my name's Mark. Hey all across Alberta and hi people. I work for an organization called Credit Counseling and they let me come and talk about money uh, generally because I know a fair bit about it. Uh, I spent some time working for a bank. I had a great big office in Bankers Hall. Is Love enough? Yeah, if we could just get everybody else to mute your microphones, that would be awesome. Um, there'll be time for questions and you can unmute at that time. All set. All right. Well, there we go. So they let me talk about money because I spent a long time working for a bank and I had a lot of discretion at that bank. I could make you really happy and give you a great big loan. Most of the time, I like to make you miserable and take all your money away because that's just what, how I roll. <laughs> um, I also spent five years as a credit counselor. And the funny thing about being a credit counselor is what we've seen um, in my seven years there, but five years as a credit counselor, is that the fastest growing segment of people coming in to see us are people who have hit retirement age. And either they're desperate to retire and they can't, they have too much debt, they don't have enough money, they don't feel they can, they're supporting their kids, or they've retired and they don't have enough money to get by. So we don't want people to struggle. And I'll tell you, everyone retires at some point. At some point you can't work, but it's how robust a retirement you want. And uh, other than that, I'm pretty well versed in the financial world. Uh, I, have my, I used to have my Canadian Securities course, my life licensing course, like it's like insurance or segregated funds. Um, if I wanted to, I don't. Um, my investment funds in Canada course. This is a hobby for me on top of my job. So if you have a question about something we don't touch on, you're welcome to ask me. I'm considered pretty well versed. If I don't know the answer, chances are I know the people that can get you the answer. Okay? So just before we jump into it, though, I'll let you know that Credit Counseling Society is a registered charity. And we've helped people, almost 500,000 of them in Canada, learn how to better manage their money. And we do that by offering free and confidential credit counseling, education courses, either live and personal libraries or lunch and learns at businesses, um, whoever will have us in, uh, by free webinars. If you guys want to learn more on different topics, you can always listen to us. Uh, by signing in at My Money Coach and signing up for our confidential course. The last thing we do is we sometimes help people figure out the way they're gonna address that. And whether that's not paying it at all, or going bankrupt, or whatever in between, we'll give you the advice that you need to go. So this is our agenda. We're gonna talk about a bunch of different things. We're gonna look at the basic types of retirement incomes. And for those of you that are retired, you may already be very familiar with this, and maybe a little disappointed in some of it. And for those of you that aren't, Let's sort of break the myths around it. Let's look at the challenges. What do people face when they retire? Because there are many of them. We'll talk about how we're going to manage and get over these things. And lastly, we're going to look at some of the resources people will rely on. By the end, I want you to be able to conduct a financial analysis of where you're at today and where you want to be when you retire, because things change a fair bit. I want you to be able to save money as you do move into retirement. And lastly, where can you get help when you really need it? And it's important because as we get older, sometimes it becomes harder to ask for help. And I find sometimes with seniors, and some studies have come out that says you guys have gone through your whole financial lives. You've done great and tremendous things. You've saved money. You've put kids through school. You've fed them for how many years? You've bought houses and paid them off. Maybe bought two houses and paid them off. So you don't really want to ask for help as readily as some other people who haven't done those great and significant things. You have to be willing to because the world has changed really quickly. And sometimes when we need help, it's just about asking for the question. Um, so let's just take a moment. I want you all to visualize what does retirement look like for you? I know some of you have retired. And some of you are hoping to retire. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow, preferably. Well, have a think about it. Because retirement's really, really broad and it's very different for everyone. And people will ask me all the time, Mark, how much money do I need to retire? And I'll tell you, there's a common thought amongst Canadians that if they can save $756,000, they can retire. Is that the right number? I have no idea, to be honest. Everyone has a different picture. My picture of retirement is living in a one-bedroom apartment, perhaps with my wife, <laughs> golfing occasionally, but pretty much being left to my own. And I say perhaps with my wife because her vision of retirement is traveling around the world nonstop all the time. It's different. My dad thought he would play golf seven days a week. He discovered he could play three days a week for about a year, and then two days a week after that. It just, sometimes you can't do the things you hope for. And you have to find other things to fill your time, or else you get lonely, and sometimes you get into money trouble. So think about exactly what you want. 
And then what I want you to do is if you're not retired, I want you to run a complete financial analysis on where you're at today. And then, because you're not busy enough in your lives, I want you to project what your retirement's going to look like by running a future financial analysis. If you're already retired, good news for you. You only have to do the current one. When we talk about a financial analysis, we want you to figure out your income. So do it today. If you're still working, put in what you're making. All the money from all the sources. Then, figure out your assets. My house is worth this much. This is how much I've saved in my RSP. I have a pension worth this much. Figure out your liabilities, the debts you have. How big is your mortgage still if you have one? Do you owe money on cars? What are my debts? How big are my credit cards? And lastly, figure out your monthly expenses. And you're going to do that now because we want you to get rid of the debt and the liabilities before you retire. Because they'll eat away at your happiness when you do retire. And then we want you to do it again in the future because your life is going to look different. Some of your assets will change. Some of your lifestyle is going to change. Let's see what it's going to cost you so you know when you have enough. In terms of sources of income when we retire, which might be future dated or we might already be tapping into them, most commonly people think about registered retirement savings. That's the money that people will put into this registered plan. They won't have to pay tax on it in the year they put it in that plan, and it's going to grow. It's going to grow tax-free until they actually start taking the money out. But that's the caveat. When you take the money out, you will be taxed. And that makes us all sad. So some of us think we're never going to have to pull that money. I'm just going to leave that money in there. It's going to grow forever. I'm never going to touch it. But the government is smart. The tax man knows what he's doing. By the time you turn 71, you are forced to take your registered retirement savings and transfer it into an income fund, most commonly a registered retirement income fund. And this is all, all okay and fine, except it says you have to take a portion of your savings out every year. And as you get older, that portion increases. So if you're 71, you have to withdraw 5.28% of the money in that registered plan. By the time you're 95, you have to pull 20% out every year. So at some point, the government gets all their tax money. And you, liquid, you liquidate the plan. That being said, it's still a great place to save. And when we transfer to a RIF, we usually do that through our financial institutions. Our bank will help us with that. Um, our life insurance company, whoever we've invested with. How much should you have in your retirement savings plan? It's going to vary for everyone. But I still think it's a great way to save if we're not there yet because we save taxes currently and the money will grow tax-free. Tax-free savings is the other big plan that's out there right now. I can't see everyone, but just in this room, has anyone heard of a tax-free savings account? Mm -hmm. Do you know what you can invest in in a tax-free savings account? See, people who come into our office go into their banks and their financial institutions and they invest in a savings account. And I'm okay with that. It's very safe. And sometimes you need your money to be very safe. But savings accounts don't pay very much interest. I understand that when they wanted to open up this program, the government wanted to call it a tax-free investment account. But the bank said, no, no, call it a savings account. In a tax-free savings account, you can invest in virtually anything. You want mutual funds, electronically traded funds, stocks, bonds. You can put it in there. And the best part about this is the, the money grows tax-free. So yeah, the money I put in, I pay tax on already. But once it's in there, it can grow. And whenever I take it out, I don't pay any tax on the money I take out. So if I bought a stock for a dollar today and it's worth a million dollars 10 years from now, that's all tax-free. And I can scoop it. Right now, the maximum contribution if you've never contributed to 63500 it's a great place to put money because you can pull it out tax-free. Pensions. Some of you will have pensions. Congratulations. I don't have one, and it makes me very sad. Pensions are nice because they often give you a set number you're working with, especially when you work for a really big institution. You'll get so much a month for however long. Fantastic. Some pensions are super rich. Some pensions aren't as rich. So I can't tell you much about your particular pension plan. Some terminate after a set period of time, and some go on for the entire period of your life. If you have them, they're nice to have. It's just a different way to save. What I am going to focus on is government income. Do you guys know what the basic government incomes are you get when you retire? You just shout it out. 583 for our OAS. Uh, it's a little bit higher right now. I think it's 6, 
Oh, it's the sign of the beast. 666, I think, this year. Oh, okay. Um, $666. Um, the other one's Canada Pension Plan. And if we're low income, there's also a, a third government subsidy called Guaranteed Income Supplement. When Canada Pension Plan came out, it wasn't really meant to cover all our retirement costs. The number I hear right now is that the hope is it'll cover about a quarter of a person's monthly retirement costs. And while the maximum you can get on it in 2019, if you retire at 65 and take the money at 65, is $1,155, give or take some change. So that's a lot of money, but it's taxable. So even though they're going to give you that $1,155, they're going to take some back. Sorry about that. It's what the tax man does. Most people don't qualify for that, though. I think this year, the average amount per person that they take out is $604, which is a little bit less. And part of that is, is because some people are taking it out before 65. They're taking it early. And when you take your Canada Pension Plan early, they give you a smaller amount every month. Right now, for every month early you take it before the age of 65, they reduce your pension amount by 0.6%. Meaning if you take it out the day you turn 60, instead of 65, you'll end up getting 36% less moving forward. On the flip side, though, some people will keep it in later. They won't take it out until they turn 70. And for every month you keep it in longer than the age of 65, you get 0.7% more when you do decide to draw, which is a 42% increase when you turn 70. So some people will wait and take the money later. When we talk about how much you're actually entitled to, it's very convoluted and complex. Canada Pension Plan is designed that people are supposed to work their whole adult life until they hit 65, ideally 47 years, 18 to 65. But most people don't do that. People lose jobs. I went to school for a couple of years and then I just hung out for a bit. Uh, people have babies. And when they have babies, sometimes they go back to work right away and other times they don't go back to work for 20 years. The plan has a little bit of a hedge for that. What it says is you don't have to have worked all 47 years. If you've worked 39 years, you could still get the maximum amount of CPP. But there's a second bit to this. You have to have contributed over that 39 years the maximum amount in each of those years to the CPP off your paychecks. Which means this year, if you're not making about $57,000 a year, you're not contributing the max, you won't be entitled to the maximum amount when you retire. To find out what you're actually entitled to, call Service Canada and ask for the CPP department. They'll tell you what it looks like for you. Fair enough? So I'm hoping to get $1,154 when my time comes. Of course, it's indexed to inflation, so it should be more. Uh, but I don't think I will because I took too much time off. And I'm hoping to retire tomorrow, which will shorten the my time frame. <laughs> Old age security is the other one. And right now I think I said it was about $666, which is the maximum amount you can receive. Unlike CPP, you cannot take it early. You can only get it at 65, but you do have the option to defer it. So you can take it as late as 70. It's not as rich a program when you defer it. As I mentioned, if you defer CPP for the full five years to the age of 70, you get 42% more money on each check, right? OAS, it only gives you a bump of 36%. So if I were trying to make a decision about which one I would take first at the age of 65 and which one I would hold longer, I would try and hold the CPP off longer if I could do without the money because it will give me more money in the long run. Fair enough? Cool. OAS is also taxable. Again, the government wants their cut. I'm sorry about this. The government wants their cut on all our retirement money. But they wanted their cut all the way along anyways. Why wouldn't they want it now? When we enroll, it's usually automatic. So as so long as you've been a resident in Canada for at least 10 years, you're a landed resident or you're a citizen, you're usually entitled to the money. And they should automatically enroll you. They're going to send you a note the year you turn 64 and say, hey, we're enrolling you in OAS. Boom. If you ask for the deferral, that's fine. You just have to contact the government and they'll push that off for you. If you don't ask for the deferral, when you turn 65, here's your money. It's pretty straightforward. 
If there's some misinformation around you, they may send you a form when you turn 64 and ask you to correct the information. But when they send you the letter, the form comes with it, you just have to return it. Pretty straightforward. I will warn you with OAS, it's a little bit different than CPP because at some point, if you have too much money in your retirement, they're going to start taking it back from you. And right now, if your retirement income is over $76,000, you're going to take a few dollars, they start taking it back. And by the time you have $120,000 in income, $122,000, they've taken all your OAS back. One of the things people will go see a financial professional for is if they've saved a lot of money for their retirement, they'll go and talk about minimizing their taxes and reducing how much their income they're drawing to ensure that they get the <coughs> maximum government benefits. Looking at this room, how we're all so nicely dressed, we're all so eager and happy. I assume you all have lots of money to retire with, so you should seek some financial advice on that so the government doesn't take your OAS back. The last one is guaranteed income supplement. The government's going to adjudicate whether or not you qualify for this when you apply for your old age security. And this is meant to help low income people. It's not very robust when you're getting guaranteed income supplement. Generally, by the time you're making about $19,000 a year in taxable income, including CPP, OAS, you no longer qualify for it. Which means it's not a lot of money to live on. $18,000 a year is pretty tight. Is that for household or individual? It's going to change a little bit depending on whether you're married, um, in which case it's going to be a combination of how much your household income is and the types of benefits you're receiving, spousal, um, widow benefit, things like that, widower's benefit, things like that. But it's not robust. If you need it, though, it's good that it's there. This is the one thing that the government can't touch, and they can't touch it anyways because you don't make enough money to be taxed. So they put it up there like, hey, it's not taxable. Well, when you're only making $18,000 a year, you can't afford to pay tax. So hopefully you don't need it. But if you do need it, it is there. And again, when you file your taxes and you're receiving OAS, they automatically adjudicate you. One of the key things about being a senior or being anyone is you always have to file your taxes in order to take advantage of the government and social services network. So if you're not filing your taxes because you don't want to, you should. Pretty important. All, the, all those things I will let you know are indexed to inflation. So as the cost of living goes up, so will your benefits. Hopefully it will go up to match. The price of bread goes up by a dime. Let's call it 10%. They should take that into account and raise your benefits so that you can still have bread. And for CPP, they do it once a year in January. I believe they do it um, quarterly for old age security. So we're on a fixed income. And I say we're on a fixed income whether we have lots of savings or whether we're just living on government income. And people sometimes struggle with this, but the truth is you're gonna draw money out and you're gonna live on that money, but you're gonna wanna keep as much in if you do have savings to make sure that you're good for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. People draw money out so that they minimize taxes and the money goes a long time. If you feel you don't have enough money having looked at that future or that retired budget, you may have to supplement. And people do not like this, but I love this idea. I love the idea that I can still go to work even when I've retired. I don't want to do this anymore. I've done this for a long time. I'll go do something else. And I joke with people. I said, I'm going to go work at Home Depot and mix paint. People say, why would you do that, Mark? Ha, ha, ha. No, really, that's my retirement plan. Why? It gives me some money. Fantastic. It lets me socialize with people. Good, because if not, I'm going to be all by myself. And I like paint. I paint all the time. Why not? If you need to generate some income, maybe you have a skill that you can sell and you still want to keep doing. Maybe you're going to go contract for your old employer, but maybe you could do something else. Maybe you want to be a Walmart reader because you like the blue vests. You're retired. Try and find your passion to chase now if you need more money and if you want to work. There are opportunities for passive income, though. Some people will look to get a tenant. Do I want a tenant? No, I have teenage children. I want no one near me anymore. But, again, it can be as much a social thing as it is a money thing for some people. You can consider it. Maybe you have a garage that you could rent out. I see more and more people are renting out trailers and RVs. Maybe you have one you're not using as much anymore. There's lots of ways to increase your income. If you need to, though, be open to the fact 
that sometimes you may have to rent a place out, especially if you're living in a house and there's still a mortgage, or that you might have to get a part-time job. When we do increase our income though, really important, we need to let our employer know that we are receiving CPP and OAS. Because if not, the employer is not gonna take enough tax off and you're gonna owe a tax bill at the end of the year. And that's a very unpleasant feeling. The flip side to increasing income is we can reduce expenses. And often, people don't want to talk about reducing expenses, but we're gonna do it anyways because our life is changing. So that's a list of things we can look at. And really, the first thing to look at is housing. We'll go back to that one. And the reason I'd say look at housing first is because when we retire, our lives are changing. Lots of people tell me they're gonna travel. Lots of people have got rid of their kids for the first time. Maybe you don't wanna live like you lived. My wife and I with our two teenagers were living in a nice little thousand square foot bungalow. It was wonderful, except there were two teenagers and only two bathrooms in the house. So we decided to move and we got a bigger house. And it's a nice house, sure. I don't mind going there. The kids have their own bathroom. They have to clean it. I never have to look at it. It works better for me. The thing is, when they go, and I do hope they go, I don't need a big house. I don't need three big bedrooms. I don't need four bathrooms in the house. I've already suggested to my wife that we rent maybe just a one-bedroom condo or a two-bedroom condo. A one-bedroom condo is a great idea because then the kids can't come back. And maybe we want to rent instead of own if she wants to travel all the time so that we're not responsible if the roof caves in and we don't have to worry. It's worth considering. When we downsize our homes, maybe we find money that we otherwise wouldn't have, and we can put that towards our retirement dreams or into our retirement savings to pay as income moving forward. The other thing is maybe we don't want to live where we used to live. If you lived out in the country for a long time on a big acreage, a big acreage is a lot of work. Maybe that's not where you want to live anymore. Maybe you want to live close to where other people are. You want to move to town. When we move to town, maybe we can change some of our other costs. The last thing I'll tell you about housing, though, because sometimes people want to stay where they're at. They've retired, but they need some money. There is something called a reverse mortgage. I don't know if you guys are very familiar with these. But once you hit about the age of 55, if you have a lot of equity in your home, there's a bank that will lend you money up to 65% of the value of your home, and they will charge you a fee to set it up, but they won't ask for any payments. What they're gonna do is they're gonna give you a big chunk of money, and they're gonna let the interest start to accrue. And when you sell the house, that's when they get paid off. It's a good idea for some people, and if you think you need to look at that as an option, I'd suggest you talk to a financial advisor or credit counselor first, because at the end of the day, when you sell the house, there's probably not a lot of money left in it for you. But if you want to stay in your house and you need the cash, for some people of retirement age, it's a good option. If you guys have more questions about that, you can ask. Maybe at the end when we turn on the screens. Fair enough? Cool. The other thing is transportation. If you move into town, you can get a smaller car. Or maybe when you retire, you and your spouse love each other so much that you're just going to go everywhere together and you can lose one of the cars you've had previously. It might be an opportunity. Depending on where you live, there's lots of other options too. In a big city, there's public transportation. Um, there's cabs, there's Lyft, there's Uber. Sometimes as we get older, we don't want to drive. My mom lives at the bottom of the big hill and she drives a standard. She's happy to drive around at the bottom of the hill. She's afraid to drive up the hill now in case she rolls backwards. Maybe she needs a new car, or maybe she just doesn't need to go up the hill. <laughs> but it's worth considering, are there other options? Someone will usually drive her up the hill if she needs to go. There's always a cab. Of course, in the city, there's things like car to go where you can share cars amongst groups of people. Um, but out in the country, that's not as readily available yet. Health is a big factor. While we're working, most of us will have some insurance. My daughter's braces will be fully covered by mine and my wife's insurance at a cost of $4,000 a year. I really like my insurance this year. Usually I don't use it, but this year it's very good. When we retire, we don't have that same benefit. However, in Alberta, when we turn 65, there is a provincial program that's gonna help you cover some of the costs. Are you guys aware of that? It's administered by Alberta Blue Cross. Now, it might not be as robust as what we're used to, but for example, it will cover 30%, or sorry, it will cover the cost of prescriptions 
um, so that your copay is 30% up to a maximum of $25. So if you have to get medication and it's $100 for the bottle, you'll pay $25 to get that bottle. It would be better if they paid it all, but they're not paying it all. You're only going to pay $25 for that bottle. So it's something. They'll help you with chiropractors if you need chiropractors. They'll help you with insulin supplies. There's a program out there to help you. And if you want to learn more, you can search Alberta Health Plan, age 65, and it pops right up on the Google machine. We can do some things to help take care of ourselves, though. And part of that is keeping active, exercising. I go to the gym occasionally. I only walk on the treadmill. And people laugh at me, look at the big guy on the treadmill. But I'm okay with that because it keeps me healthy. But keeping healthy is one of the great things that you can do to keep yourself, you know, fit and healthy and happy in retirement. And I hear that people mall walk. I'm going to golf. That's my thing. I'm going to sit with three other guys and we're going to laugh and cheat and lie about what we're doing on the golf course. It's going to be super. It's social and it's good for us. And mental health is a big part of it. Keeping active in the community helps. The other thing, though, is we can look for cheaper resources. If we need pills, we can get the generic version instead of the name brand version. If your doctor really wants you to have the name brand version, he will tell you. In terms of eyeglasses, which apparently many of us have, there's places you can get cheap eyeglasses. Have you guys ever heard of Zenni? No. Oh. <laughs> have you? Most people don't know what Zenni is. It's, it's, you can buy glasses online, prescription glasses online for $30 a pair. What? My <laughs> friend... Spell the name, sorry. Z-E-N-N-I. Yeah. Okay. Dot com. Now, it's not quite as easy as going into the glasses place. They're going to ask you to do some things. They're going to ask you to download a picture so you can try the glasses on a picture instead of on your face. All right. They're going to ask you to measure the distance between your pupils. You might need some help with that. Someone will help you measure. Not a big deal. And then they'll send you glasses. My friend Adam, who I worked with, used his whole health spending account to buy 100 pairs of glasses. At the time, they were only $6 a pair. We used to call them bubbles because they were so thick. That's how thick the lenses were, $6 a pair. Now, he had a strange, misshapen head, and they all looked terrible on him. But you're a lovely group, and I'm sure they would work well for you. <laughs> so think about it, zenny.com. But there's lots of different deals like that. Clearly is another one. Clearly is another one, absolutely. So there are options for you. And anytime you need something, I'm going to encourage you to go look on the Google and see if it's there, or go look on Kijiji. Healthcare supplies, sometimes you can get them for free or very cheap. If you need a wheelchair, an adjustable bed, something like that, if you go on to Kijiji and just search for it. And when I want things on Kijiji, I usually ask if they'll give them to me for free. You could do that too. Just an option. You'd be amazed what you can get. Food. Food's a big one, especially in my life. I'm not the biggest eater in my family. My son has size 11 feet, and he's about this tall, and he's sadly 13, which means in another year, I won't be able to handle him. That's okay, though, because he's a lovely boy. But food is very, very expensive. And I know that sometimes when people don't have much to do, when they first retire, they decide they're going to become great cooks. But it can be expensive if you don't plan it out. And seniors have great discount days, whether it's going to the movie theaters or whether it's going to the grocery store. Take advantage of them. If they'll give you a discount or more air miles back, go get it. When you shop, use a go price match. Take your flyers into the Safeway if you're shopping at the co-op. And vice versa, and ask them for the best price. Why not? They All the big retailers will price match their major competitors. Use your freezer. Simply because the size of your family is reduced doesn't mean you can't buy in bulk to save money. Load up your freezer with, with meat. It'll last a long time. And plan your meals out. Embracing the idea of cooking for one or two. My mom struggles with this. Because, of course, I have a twin brother. And any time we get together, my mom makes a six-pound meatloaf and a whole tray of cabbage rolls that she would like to see us eat on the spot. Why? Because she's never gotten over the idea that she no longer has a family of six. It's okay to make smaller portions. Or if you need to make big portions, portion them out and throw them in the freezer. You don't have to make them again. Let's not generate waste. And if we keep it easy, we're not tempted to eat out. And often people will go to eat out in lieu of some other social activity. And eating out is dangerously expensive when we're on a fixed income. And it's a trap lots of people fall into because I'm too tired to go and make dinner. 
I don't want to cut the onions. Do it all at once and eat at home where it's cheap. I think going out for coffee with your friends or meeting for lunch or happy hour is a great idea. Going out for dinner and having two drinks is a $50 bill. Be careful. When you're dealing with utilities, often there's better plans for seniors. If you're a senior who doesn't have a ton of money, Shaw will actually give you basic cable for a very, very low price. They also sometimes have special senior discounts if you need help with cell phones or other major utilities because they have to make sure you guys are still around. They don't want to let you be shut-ins and not have anything to do. Low-income people still have to have these things, and the big companies will help them. Now, hopefully you're not low-income. But even then, with the cost of property taxes, there are also property tax um, help if that's what you need. In Calgary, for example, if you're a senior and you can't afford to pay your property tax, they just start adding the bill up and put a lien against your property. When it's sold, they'll deal with it. And our property taxes are getting a little bit high. I don't know if it's the same in all your different communities. Sometimes you're entitled to other discounts and other help. There's often energy rebate programs for seniors when you go to buy light bulbs, or if you need help with someone auditing you for um, electricity usage and other things. Go look at the Alberta Energy Utilities Commission or Google search it online and see what's available to you. Entertainment, tons of stuff to do, and you no longer have to do it when everyone else does it, which is the best thing at all. If you want to go play golf on a Monday morning, it's two for one at Chess in Chestermere. Why not go play golf on a Monday morning? You don't have to play on Saturday when it's a six hour round. You guys might not be golfers. But there's also cheap days at movies. You get a senior's day at Value Village. I treat Value Village like a place where I go treasure hunt. They will not give me the senior's discount. <laughs> yes, I'm coming close. But you can also access community program, and that's often through the library. It might be through the Kirby Center in Calgary. It might be through a big rec center. And often seniors play, pay a lower price. Sometimes the programs are completely free. They might be educational. They might be physical. Um, or they have other great resources that you can connect with in the event you need some help. So don't be afraid to go and seek them out. We put friends and family in here because, A, they're expensive. And I think why seniors are coming in to see us more and more is because their middle-aged children are tapping them out. Hey, I got this big mortgage. I got the kids in hockey. And, uh, you know, I built up $35,000 in credit card debt. Can you help me? And parents want to help their kids. So they tap out their savings and they run into a debt cycle. And for those that you can't see, I think there's a story in this room here in Strathmore. <laughs> <laughs> but they want to help their kids. And they do. And then they get into trouble and they run up debt. And they can't afford the lifestyle they want anymore. Be careful. The other thing I'm going to warn people about as they retire is that sometimes retirees especially as they get older and older and maybe a little bit more infirmed, are very big, um, very big casualties of identity theft and fraud. And often that fraud and identity theft is done by their kids, grandkids, and other relations, people who come into their house who they should have a good trusting relationship with. So you need to be careful. You need to set limits. And if something doesn't feel right, you need to ask for help. Going back to kids, though, a few things. Don't give them anything anymore. Once your kids are grown, they bought houses, they have all they need, you don't have to give them anything. You've given them stuff all their life. You got them through school. You held their hands when their hearts were broken. You bought them everything they ever needed. It's time they gave to you. It's okay to say, I'm done. And that's what I encourage my mom to do with us. Stop sending us stuff. We don't need it. My mom also likes to go to the Value Village and thrift shop. And every Christmas, she sends me a nice Hawaiian-looking shirt, but it's almost always a ladies. So sadly, it's a pretty cool color, but it only goes up to my belly button. <laughs> Don't send your grandkids tons of stuff either, because it's not like when we were young. I used to play with G.I. Joe and Hot Wheels. Kids do electronics now. It's their whole lives. My mom sends my kids a DVD every Christmas. We haven't had a DVD player in like five years. The DVDs still come. It's all right to set a limit and put yourself first at this point. You've carried the load for so long, limit what you're going to give back. If your kids are still going to live with you, that costs you money. Make them pay rent. I remind my kids on a regular basis that when they turn 18, they want to stay in the house. I want some cash for it. 
My boy eats like an animal. My little girl takes showers for 50 minutes at a go. The walls weep with water when she comes out. <laughs> it's all money that I can't afford. It's okay to limit it. Have the conversation. Be frank. Watch out if they ask for large sums of money because that's what's really going to hurt you in the long run when you exhaust your savings. There's no more helping your kids with down payments. It's now time to help yourself to trip away. And we put credit in here because sometimes we want to do things, we feel entitled, we've worked hard, and we think it's all right to just drop it on a credit card. We've got to be careful because now we're limited. If we need to deal with credit, the way we need to deal with credit is to pay it off. And ideally, we want to do this before we retire. And that includes the mortgage and the credit cards and the homeowner's line of credit. Because when we don't have debt, we're free to do whatever we want. So, if we still have debt, let's try and consolidate it. And while I'm not a super big fan of people consolidating debt onto their house, it is the cheapest way to repay debt. So if you have a big debt and you need to clear it off before you retire or as you retire, use the home equity to get a 3 4% interest rate instead of paying a 20% credit card interest rate. It makes sense. But then put all your gusto into getting rid of that debt. Because once that's done, you're truly free. Once we get rid of it, get rid of the credit cards. I know credit cards are great. And if you pay them off every month, good for you. And if you get points for it, so much the better. Because I get points on my credit card and that's why I use it. But never for a minute will I pay interest. I'm not paying someone 20% when I could pay cash. Even for the points. So if you have a credit card problem, maybe it's home shopping. Maybe it's just swiping card the credit card at Tim Hortons five times a day. Stick it in jello and throw it in the freezer for when you need it. Don't run it up. What we do see is that people say, I needed to go on a trip. Oh, I had to go on a trip. It was once in a lifetime. What they do is they end up putting something like $3,000 on a credit card to go on a trip. And an interest rate on a credit card is like 20%. It's pretty high. And they're actually going up now. I've seen as high as 39.9 on some, oh which is a little expensive. And you have to repay 2% of that back every month, whatever your outstanding balance is. If that's what we do on $3,000 and just make that minimum payment, it takes us 52 years to pay off. I'm 45 and eat a lot of cheese. If I make it to 52, I'm pretty pleased. Am I going to be around 52 years? I'm pretty sure I'm not. I like pizza too much. The interest we pay on this is almost $13,000. This trip ends up costing us 16 grand. If this is what you're doing, you get one trip and you'll never get to go on another one. The next scenario just suggests that we pay an extra 10 bucks. So let's say you need the credit. You have to borrow the three grand. You have to get the car back on the road. Well, by adding $10 to our minimum payment, we cut it into a quarter of how long we're paying back. And the interest rates of, and the interest we pay is about a third. It's a way better scenario. It's still too much money at $7,500, but it's better than 15,000. And the last scenario says, let's just pay a set 120. It's only two years and nine months to pay it off, and the interest is a fraction of $1,000. If you want to go on a trip or do something really cool, I'm going to suggest if it's a $3,000 trip, buying $250 in your budget every month and save it. And that way, every year you pay cash for your trip, and you're already saving for your next trip the year after when you come home. $250 every month, a trip every year. It sounds pretty good to me. So who to talk to? Everyone's in a different financial position. Circumstances happen. Sometimes they change and shift. Often we're not where we want to be. I thought I'd be living on a cruise ship by now, and here I stand in Strathmore on a Wednesday night. <laughs> and I'm happier to be here than on a cruise ship. But we need help. And that's because we're not all experts on navigating the investment world. We're not all experts on navigating the debt world. We're not all experts in finding a little extra money if we need it. So a financial advisor, if you don't have one, Right now, why not go into your financial institution, your credit union, or a bank, and say, look, this is where I need to get to, or this is where I'm at today. How do I get to this point where I find my happiness? They're there to help you, and I know lots of financial people at banks. They're there because they want to help you. Go on and talk to them. See what they can do. If you don't want to talk to your bank, I mostly deal with an insurance company. Sun Life is a great insurance company. Uh, Manulife, great insurance company. They can help you too. Do your research. Find an institution that you feel safe. Employment centers. 
Maybe you're looking for a little extra cash. You can go to a, talk to an employment center, get a resume. Maybe you're just going to go work as a demonstrator at Costco. Another job I've thought about doing, except if I was demonstrating pizza, of course, no one will get any. But they might have ideas how to generate a little extra income. Community groups, because it's not all necessarily about money. Sometimes it's about the social aspect. You know, they might have book clubs you can join, chess clubs, uh, water, swimming programs, whatever you're into. Go tap the resources. If you can find free programs, so much the better. Sometimes spending a little money, just a little money, brings you huge amounts of satisfaction. Counselors. It could be a credit counselor like my organization. Sometimes we just need other counselors to help us through. That's okay, too. Often when we first step into retirement, it is a huge lifestyle change. And when I see people come into my office, it's usually not because they've done something bad. Usually it's because something smacked them upside the head they weren't expecting. They lost a job, they're sad. Someone got sick, they're sad and tired. Someone died, they have no one to talk to. Ask for help. It's okay. If you don't know who to ask for help, a great place to go is to call 311. 311 is a joint effort between the municipalities, mostly across Canada now, and the YMCA. And even if they don't put you through to someone in your community, they're going to put you through to the right resource in one of the big centers, probably Edmonton or Calgary, and they're going to know where to send you because they're connected all across the province. Right? So call 311 if you don't know where to access the help. And the last one is legal aid. If you qualify for it and usually have to be making less than $35,000 a year and you need legal help, there are legal aid programs across the province. Other resources? Canadian Association of Retired People. These, pe uh, these people advocate for seniors. They also get you all sorts of discounts based on your membership. So you can flip your card and get a cheap room at the hotel. Why not go look it up see what they have to offer? Community networking groups. In Calgary, we have the Kirby Center. It's fantastic. People get together. They do things they like to do. They have a resource center if they're looking for some information. If they want to work out, they'll go find people to work out with. And lastly, provincial resources, especially in terms of healthcare. Look up Alberta Healthcare 65 and older on the Google, and it will bring you up the resources you're entitled to. So it's your retirement. You figure it out. You've got to figure out exactly what it looks like. Because only you know what makes you happy. But until you know what it looks like, you don't know when you can retire. You don't know how much you need to have. What you do know is that CPP and OAS may not be quite as robust as we all hope to be. But it is something. And likely we're all entitled to a little bit there. We know that we should save some money. And that when we're looking to save money, maybe it's about adjusting our lifestyle to fit what we see in our retirement. It's about not mowing lawns anymore. But watching some guy do that for you from your condo balcony, maybe. It would be a pleasant change. If you need help, ask for it. We're terrible at asking for help. If you need money, advice on investments, go ask for it. Advice on credit, go ask for it. Advice on who to talk to, go ask for it. To run a financial analysis. I want you to do that. To do this, what I would recommend you do is go to mymoneycoach.ca. On that website, you're going to find a vast array of tools. It's not as overwhelming as it sounds, but you can get budgets. You can get information on assets, liabilities. Um, you can get expense trackers. You can just get general information. MyMoneyCoach.ca. Take some action to save some money. Watch how many coffees we're drinking. I used to drink eight extra larges a day, 15 bucks a day over the course of a year is 5,500 bucks. I don't drink eight coffees a day anymore. And know where you can get help when you need it. If you want more information, you know, we've helped almost a half million Canadians across Canada. So you can always call us for help at Credit Counseling Society. You can sign up at Facebook. You can follow me at Twitter, at CCS underscore Mark K. You could be the next 10 people bringing me up to 18, which would be super after two years. Um, or just call our number. Look us up at nomoredebts.org.